Uh, so we're going to continue with this uh, short chapter today. And there's no meeting tomorrow, right? It's in the syllabus. <coughs> um, there will be a few pages short of finishing it today, so we'll do that first thing on Monday and then get into the problem set for this chapter, okay? And that will carry over to Tuesday. So we're following, we're following the syllabus. Um, so where we're where we are now here in this piezo, in this chapter on piezoelectric called piezoelectric materials is we're um, looking at piezo ceramics and again it's important for you to realize that what this is is some some ferroelectric material is heated is. Um, created in this ceramic, okay, it's cooked up, and then it's polarized. So, and we call that almost always, this is the Z or three axis, is the axis of polarization. So you want to think of this as there's all these dipole moments, they're actually domains, little tiny domains are composed of many molecules, but doesn't really matter. You can think of it this way. These things are pretty much all aligned like this. Okay, going this way. And in a, in a rectangular geometry like this, the typical geometries, there's no net bound charge here. It occurs at the surfaces. So this will become a net positive charge and you can see, you can just see why. If this is the this is the boundary here, right? And similarly down here will become a net negative charge. Uh, so that's what happens when it's polarized. Now, so how do we handle this quantitatively? Well, it's all the all the information is in or is in these three matrices, right? The compliance matrix the dielectric, uh, the permittivity matrix, and then the coupling between the, the piezoelectric strain matrix. And it's important to recognize here that we have rotational symmetry about the z-axis, because the way this is, you know, when it's, when it's cooked up, there's no pre preferred direction, and then we polarize it in one direction, we'll have axial symmetry, sym symmetry about the z-axis here. And that goes a very long way in explaining and understanding why the compliance matrix, matrix and the other matrices have the form that they do. So that's what we're going to go over now. Um, <clears throat> so um, let me first point out here that if you compare this to quartz a few pages before, you'll find that this is significantly simpler. In particular, <clears throat> Quartz has an S1, a 1,4, and a 2,4 element. They happen to be equal and opposite. Uh, but here it's zero. Okay, see it's zero here. And remember, this is always a symmetric matrix. Um, and also, quartz has a 5,6. And of course, a 6,5 by symmetry. And um, it happens to be twice the 1, 4 value. And it's, it's not zero. But here we have zeros. The 5, 6 is zero. OK. So how do we appreciate this? Well, let's begin. This is the simplest place. Let's look uh, along, the di the, along the diagonal here. This is. Remember, this is describing tensile strain, the shears, the shears over here. So you'll notice these two values are the same. Why are they the same? When I subject this to a stress in the x direction, I'm going to get a certain strain. This tells me how much I get for a given stress. The strain is equal to this times the stress. If <coughs> I subject it to the same stress, but instead of in the y direction, I do it in the x direction, what has to happen? It's got to be the same by the rotational symmetry. So that's why we have this. 
excuse me. In the z direction, in general, it's different. And we would expect that because it's been polarized. That's, it's different. It's been polarized in that direction. And that has an influence on the elasticity. That's been really the whole point here, right? The piezoceramic, piezoelectric material. Okay, uh, so I better follow this or I'm just going to get hopelessly complicated here. Uh, yeah, so this is independent of those, which makes complete sense. Um, let's look, let's keep going along the diagonal here. Look at these two are the same. Now, what does this mean? Well, this is. This is shear, and it's a shear of what plane? Well, you know, this 4 corresponds to the x, so it's the yz, right? So it corresponds to the x-axis. So if I subject this to a shear in the x direction, you know, like this, a stress, a shear stress, it's going to strain. If I subject it to the same stress here, it's got a strain the same amount because of the rotational symmetry. That's why these two are the same. In general, this one's different. This is S66. And for reason that I don't know, but if anybody's interested in finding out, I'd love to know. <laughs> but you need to do the legwork, right? <laughs> that's, that's <laughs> um, it's given by this, OK? But the point, what we just want to see here is that it's different. In general, it's different from these two. Um, okay. <coughs> All right. Uh, now there's more. Let's let's look. Let's see if I can get this. Oh, okay, that's good. Now we've looked at the diagonal elements. Let's look at the off-diagonal elements. You'll notice these two are the same here. So, what's the meaning of that? Um, if I exert a stress in the um, a tensile stress in the z direction, okay. So you want to imagine here. Remember, this gets multiplied by the six-dimensional T matrix. So imagine there's a z, a, a, a stress in the z direction. When I do that matrix multiplication, I'm going to pick up, uh, this is going to be multiplied by the stress, this is going to be multiplied by the stress. This is telling us that when we stress it in the pole direction, the polarized direction here, it, um, it strains the same in the x, y, z direction. Has to be by rotational symmetry. That's why those two, those two have to be the same. Okay. Uh, what about S? Let's look here. We can look this way. Now, if you look this way, if you stress it in the x direction, this tells you, this dictates how much strain you're going to get in the. <laughs> Sorry. If we, I guess we're going to strain it in the y direction, right? Okay, because I'm looking at this. Okay, so I'll thank you. So I'm straining in the y direction. This tells me how much. I'm stressing it in the y direction. This is going to tell me how much strain in the x direction. This tells me how, this tells me how much strain in the z direction. And those should, in general, be different. Because we've got this, we're breaking, you know, this is different, different along this axis. So that makes complete sense. Um, <clears throat> next here, as you see, we got a lot of zeros here. Um, and the way we can summarize this is that when you have a shear, uh, a shear stress, you don't get any you don't get any shear strain about. Uh, corresponding to a different axis. All the off-diagonal elements are zero here. So if you shear it along any direction, let's say I go like this, you don't get a shear on any other direction. That's what that's saying, okay? Um,
And this is maybe not so obvious, but I've been, I went through this. this this is due to the, the rotational symmetry. You can show that. But I don't think it's immediately obvious. Um, okay. So I think that, I think that for the S matrix, I think that pretty well takes care of it. I think it, all, it all makes sense. We can actually account for all of this the zeros and the repeated end is the repeated values here as a consequence of the rotational symmetry. Let's now look at the um, sometimes called the dielectric matrix or the permittivity matrix. It's given by this and this is immediately obvious. Remember we've got this axis of symmetry in the z direction. So you want to think of this as if you apply an electric field in the x direction you're going to get some polarization. You're going to cause some polarization in the x direction. And if you do the same electric field in the y direction, it's got to be the same. Just these two values have to be the same because of the rotational symmetry. And it can be in general different in the z direction. So that makes complete sense. I want to remind you, though, that um, this value, because this value is in general different from this value, we talked about this long ago. Because of that, if, let's, wait, let's, I think we can use this diagram. If you apply an electric field in some, not along some axis, but in some direction like this, what's the polarization? Is the polarization going to point along that direction? You can make a mistake here and think that because we have a diagonal matrix, you think, oh, if you electric field this way, it's going to. But that's not true, right? Because the permittivity is different in this direction in general than this direction. So, if there's a, you know, if it's a greater susceptibility, greater permeability here, the polarization will lie in this direction. <coughs> so, <coughs> don't think that just because we have a diagonal matrix that we've got this typical isotropic relationship where the polarization is in the direction of electric field. We don't because this is in general different. Uh, okay, the final matrix is the piezoelectric strain matrix. Now this is usually presented um, this way and it's, it takes up less vertical space. That's probably why people do it. But let me remind you here, these are the components. It's how the, uh, what strain you get, the change in strain due to the change in electric field, as you know. And it has all these different directions, right, or different components. Um, so from this, we can find, we can get the strain in terms of the electric field. And there's this little problem here. Remember, this M is not, the M occurs first, not second. So we would write this in vectric matrix notation, and I'll add this in. We can write this like this. Okay, you have to take the transpose because that M is appearing first and not second. You have to take the transpose. An alternative way of writing it is um, just to put the D over here. And you can see that from here. To find the stress, I can find that I need to multiply D by E. And here I would multiply by a horizontal. It's, it's understood here that this E is not the usual vertical vector. It's horizontal. And it has to be here, right? It has to be. You multiply this by E, that gives you a six-dimensional vector here, which is the strain. So usually, um, we could write, if you want to deal, you know, if you want to deal with, with this or this, then we would have to take the transpose of this. But usually it's, list, usually it's displayed like that. So you need to be a little bit careful here, but the rectangularity of this thing tells you what you've got to do. You've got to pre-multiply uh, by E, not post-multiply. We usually think of the matrix times the vector. You have to pre-multiply by here, and it's obvious because of the geometry. here. That's the only way you can make sense out of it. So you don't really need to remember that. You just need to look at the geometry there. Okay, well, there are, let's look at this. There are a lot of zeros here. 
um, the fact that we have this block of zeros here <coughs> means that if we have an electric field, so you may, again, you want to think of the electric field here. If we have it in the x, suppose it's in the, the x direction. Okay, so we just have a component here and these are zeros. You can see that we get, it, there's no tensile strain in any other direction. Okay, and um, you know, is this reasonable? Well, I don't know. I don't know if that's obvious from this. You know, from this cartoon here, if I apply an electric field this way, it's telling me we're getting no, we're getting no strain in that direction. Seems reasonable because we got the polarization here. In fact, you know what you're going to tend to do when you apply an electric field here, you're going to tend to push the, the positives this way and the negatives that way. <coughs> you don't, and we're going <coughs> to. This is in the notes, and we'll get to it, but we already hit it here. <coughs> Excuse me. It's not going to cause a tensile strain. What is it going to cause? Now, I, I need to be a little bit more careful here. These are going to tend to cancel out, but what we're left with is, is an effective positive bound charge here and a negative bound charge here. And you can see that from here. And this is shear, right. So if we call this the x direction, um, actually, we should probably call it the y direction because we're calling this the z. So x is out. We want to conform to the right hand rule, right? We want a right handed coordinate system. So if I exert an electric field here, these, this net positive bound charge here is going to be pushed this way. This is going to push that way. That's going to be a uh, shear in the z direction or a shear of in the x direction, which is a shear of the yz plane. And, we, and that should be in here, and it is. And we'll see it in a minute. It happens to be right here. That's why those two are there. So it's very physical why these are here. Um, okay, so um, we imagine exerting an electric field in the y direction. Same thing happens in the x direction. It has to be by symmetry. There's no strain in any direction. Uh, we have a D31 here. This shows that if you have an electric field in the Z direction, when we apply an electric field here in the Z direction, okay, so now we have 0, 0, and then some value of the electric field in the, in the Z direction. You can see that we get the same strain in the X and Y direction. It has to be by rotational symmetry. Now that sounds like Poisson. Right? But it's not. There, it's, it's independent of Poisson, but it's similar to that. And we'll, there'll be some more statements of that shortly. I'm getting a little bit ahead here. Uh, and this is in general, D33 is in, different, is in general different from D3, D31 because it's, the material is different in that direction. You'd expect that. Um, we have some zeros down here. Okay, this means that if we had a, um, an electric field in the z direction, that's the direction of polarization, and where we hold, you know, also where we electroplated the material, that we would have no shear strain. Okay, so if I apply an electric field this way, can it shear this way? Well, some piezoelectric material do, okay, but this can't. And the reason is, if it sheared this way, it would just as be likely shear this way because we have rotational symmetry, so it can't shear. That's, that's, uh, that may sound strange to you. That's a perfectly legitimate argument. So if it did shear in this direction, you know, why would it shear there and not shear there? It, it has rotational symmetry, so it can't shear. End of story, okay? All right, so that makes sense. Now, uh, 
we have these D15s here, and that's what we just explained. If you have, uh, I've chosen, we think of this again as this is the, let's take this to be the Y direction. So we have an electric field in the Y direction. I'm going to pick up, because of this, when I do the multiplication here, of the, the, the vector matrix multiplication, for an electric field in the Y direction, I'm going to pick up um, a shear here. And this shear is associated with a force component that's, that's x. It's going to shear in the x direction, which is the yz plane. And it's for certainly reasonable, you can see here, because these are going to be forced that way. This bound charge, bound charge because it's negative, is going to be forced this way. And similarly, that's why that's there. OK. All right, so now, um, let's now look at consequences of, for piezoelectric. We've discussed how the symmetry really forces, I think, just about everything here. The, the zero elements, or the non-zero elements, whichever way you want to look at it. Um, here are, here's how we quantitatively handle this. All the information is embodied in these piezoelectric equations here. In vector matrix form, right? So what we do is, you can imagine taking all of these three matrices here, the D, and the epsilon, and the little s, shoving it into here, and what do you get? Okay, so it doesn't, it looks a little complicated, but it's certainly a lot less complicated than the quartz, remember? That was, that was a real nightmare. This is, this is not real bad. <coughs> There are a lot of equations. <coughs> There's a number of entries on the right here. But again, the way we deal with this is we look at special cases. So let's do that here. And this is a really simple case here. It's, um, it's, and it's, I checked, it's in the book. And we'll, get, we'll get something out of this, okay? But it is really simple. It's completely stress-free. Okay, so this is how to, how to, you know how people get this. Well, I guess you haven't, really seen this yet, but in the next experiment, you'll look at a transducer in and out of water. Okay, and the point there is that when it's out of water, it's essentially a vacuum, so it's stress-free. Um, okay, so here's, the, it's a rectangular geometry. There's no stress anywhere, and again, it's, um, it's polarized Z directions, the direction of polarization, and it's electroplated in that direction for right now. Now we can imagine driving, <coughs> because it's, uh, so we're going to imagine driving, putting an oscillating voltage across these two plates right here, <coughs> okay, in the three direction. So we'll be <coughs> oscillating the free charge on there, right? When I put a voltage across here, free charge will flow. <coughs> so there'll be a D3, but there'll be, no, it won't be a, D, um, a D2 or a D1, because there's no free charge in that direction. The only free charge is only in the Z direction here. We have zero stress. Okay, so the whole, all six elements of the stress vector are zero. So we substitute put those zeros into these equations, plus the fact that D1 and D2 have to be zero. And this all collapses down to something quite simple. We have um, strain perpendicular to the, um, you know, to the, to the action here. That there's going to be, to the electric field, there's going to be an electric field here. And it causes a strain in the other direction. That's that Poisson type thing. We'll look at that a little more closely in a minute but it's coming from the electric field, not from the strain in the three direction. There is a strain in the three direction through the electric field. This is the usual, usual piezoelectric thing. <coughs> and you know what's gonna happen here. <coughs> if I change the electric field in, this, in the three direction, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, there's gonna this is gonna uh, strain. All right, that seems very reasonable, right? If I increase the electric field, it's gonna elongate because there's an upward force on the positive charge and a ne downward force on the negative charge. And again, to be careful, that action is actually not taking, 
Well, uh, in our physical appreciation of this, <coughs> These charges are all going to cancel out, but you end up with a net positive bound charge here and negative bound charge here. So when I apply an electric field in that direction, this thing's going to stretch. Because that's going that way and that's going that way. Uh, and here's the relationship between D3 and E3. And all the other values are zero. Uh, now, I want to... We're going to hit this one more time here. <laughs> about this effective Poisson's ratio for the, due to an electric field, okay, rather than a, rather than a strain. Um, you'll see we have tensile strains here in all directions. If you look up uh, typical values, and they're in the textbook, a lot of values for different materials in the textbooks, as, uh, textbook, as, as I've mentioned. If you look up D33, um, It's, it's always positive, okay? And we just, we, we just discuss why that is, right? It's, I think it has to be positive, okay? <coughs> and we just discussed that, okay? But if you look up D31, okay, the D31 tells you when you apply an electric field here what kind of strain you get perpendicular to it. That is only typically negative. Now, for the theory of elasticity, if I stretch something this way, it's going gonna, it's gonna to contract. So it's always negative for elasticity, as far as I know. There may be some weird new materials where strange things happen, but I don't know. That's, uh, my recollection is there's actually a stability problem there. Poisson's ratio for elasticity has to go, that effect has to go opposite. When you stretch something, it's got to contract. I mean, um, unless you do something else with the intermolecular forces there, you think it would happen? Yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm sure that I, I, I can't think of it right now, but I'm, I, I'm, I'm betting that there's a basic physical principle that's involved here when you, from an elasticity point of view. Now, if you have, we, we have to be a little careful here. If you've got material that's we, we tend to think of isotropic material, you know, when we think of elasticity. So uh, it's, um, I, I just don't know. But anyway, as, as far as I do know, just from experience, is that when you stretch something this way, it's going to contract perpendicular to that, okay? But be warned that, that there could be some special materials out there. However, here, in the electrical case, it can go, this is only typical, it can go either way. So I want to point that out to you. This is, an, this, and I, this is what happened when I was preparing this, okay? I was, felt uneasy about this electric, I, I was thinking, oh, this electric effect is just Poisson's ratio. It's just the electric field is changing, is straining it, and then the strain is causing the Poisson effect. But it's not true, and this points it out very dramatically here. It can go the other way. It's only typically negative. So that sort of put the nail in the coffin. That makes, that's when I realized, yeah, these are two independent effects here. We, I, and I, I'm guessing a lot of other people tend to refer to the electric effect as a Poisson type effect, okay? But you need to be aware that it can go both ways, all right? It's independent, and it happens to be able to go both ways. Uh, now, I, I don't, I'm pretty sure this is not in the book, but another problem that bothered me going down through this. And I noticed that it hits students. Uh, it also hits students. It's a natural question, but it just doesn't seem to be addressed. It's not addressed in Brian's book, and I don't remember. I think I looked in other books and didn't see it, but I can't remember. This is polarized in the z-direction. What, hap what happens if we electroplate it in another direction? Right? Is there any advantage to that? Well, we can get an indication of that here. In this particular example, okay, a very simple example. Let's suppose that we now put electrodes on the faces that are perpendicular to the x-axis. So now these shaded regions here are going to be, this is going to be shaded now, okay, so it's the x. We, we, we do it that way. And now let's see what the equations imply, again for our stress-free situation. 
this is what we get. It just collapses down to almost nothing. Okay, this has got to be there because I've got free charge in the x direction. I'm going to have this a, a displacement field because we, we, we're putting on taking off free charge. Okay, so you know that has to be there. Um, we do pick up a shear here, which is this is usually not useful. Okay, especially in sonar, or as you can imagine, because sound is longitudinal. <laughs> um, so this is not very useful. Why is this there? See, can you see it? Let's see. We've got an electric field in the x direction now. It's polarized here. Do you see it? So imagine, remember this is polarized, so there's a bunch of positive bound charge on this, up here on this surface, and a bunch of negative bound charge there. When I exert an electric field this way, what happens? It shears. Same thing we saw before. And sure enough, it should be D15. That's the D, which is what we just talked about before. So that makes complete sense, but not really useful. So this is an indication that uh, you want to electrode and along the direction you polarize. And incidentally, I think that's how they do polarize these things, right? We talked about that. It's the obvious way to do it. So that's in addition to this. And um, I talked to Jay about this. We've never seen, in the lab, we have a lot of samples, as you saw last week, and they're all polarized. They're plated, electroplated in the same direction that they're polarized. And it's not just rectangular geometries. There's there's rings, you know, and there's disks, as you saw. And we'll get more into that as the course goes on. Right now we're pretty much sticking with rectangular geometry, right, for simplicity. Uh, okay, any questions so far? Okay, so... There was a problem. So we're in the Cold War now, okay? And, and you know, people in my generation, we, we're like, we're, what's the word, uh, scarred? No, um, yeah, I guess, we, we're, we're like, we're permanently altered by the Cold War, okay? <laughs> you know, it's just, it was just unavoidable. I mean, we, Every week when you have to tra practice, you're in like elementary school and you have to practice a duck and cover drill. Do you know what duck and cover means? You can probably imagine, okay? So, um, it, it, you know, I don't think it affected me that much, but one of my brothers claims it, it permanently altered his life. <laughs> he, he's you know, being a psychology, psychology major. But, but he, he, he attributes, uh, you know, that. that fundamentally changed him. And I'm sure it changed a lot of people. Um, because it was a really scary thing, as you all must, you've all seen documentaries, right? But anyway, so there's this problem of, uh, you know, submarines carrying nuclear warheads parked off your coast. So, sonar, became, as I mentioned to you before, sonar became ex intensely investigated. And it's unbelievable what, what they did. And you will see this again and again as we go on in this piezo-ceramic material here, and, and other materials, as we'll describe. So anyway, one of the problems is, with these ceramics, is that, as I mentioned to you, you can try to prepare you know, a ceramic one way, and then try to duplicate that, and it's, it'll be different. There's, it's sensitive to little things that people really don't know what's going on. So the problem is, is that the, for use in the U.S. Navy of, of these ceramics for sonar, there wasn't really good tolerance on the, um, on the properties of these the sonar, these piezo-ceramic material. So they set standards. Usually we call these standards. What are they, what are they called here? Well, well, this is a classification, okay? And there are, it persists to this day. There are four types um, here. Now the word hard here, okay, this is where my lack of experience fails me here. It, it sounds like, you know, the material is, some materials are hard and some are softer, right? That may be true here, I'm not really sure, but it has the specific meaning of hard means that it's hard to, it's hard to depolarize it, okay? It's difficult, it, it keeps its polarization. So this is what you want for a driver. 
when you're driving something very, you want to detect something out there and you just, you want to crank up the amplitude and you're going to sacrifice the whales and the dolphins, you know, for, uh, which is, the Navy is hugely sensitive to, I, I found out. I was really surprised. Um, they're, you know, they're actually af afraid of environmentalists, people pushing, but it's, it's kind of interesting. I think it's a good thing. There's, there's pretty good evidence that sonar can cause, can really cause big disruptions in these animals. Um, so anyway, for transmitting, for creating sound, for broadcasting or whatever, project, we use the word usually projection in underwater sound, you want something that's not good, you're going to drive it, tend to drive it pretty hard, you, and that can cause depolarization. So you want what's called a hard material. So you can see that there are these type 1 and type 3. These tend to be used for projectors. There's, oh, I don't think, I'm sorry, I think this was in the notes, but I didn't mention it. The standard materials are, uh, it was in the notes previously. There's, we've talked about barium titanate. That kind of caused a sort of revolution because it was the first, in World War II, it was the first ceramic, and it directed people's attention to ceramics as use in sonar. Uh, but the, more, the much more popular one is lead, zirconate, titanate. You've all probably heard of this. It's PZ, called PZT for short. Okay, that's the really popular one. And it continues to be. So um, the property, you can look in the textbook. I didn't want to, it, it's lengthy. For the requirements or the standards, however you want to think of them, for these types, they're listed out here. I just listed some of the essential, just the basic classification here. Um, there's two hard ones here, and these, this is the Curie temperature. Remember, you want to, if you get near the Curie temperature, you can, um, you're going to start to lose your polarization. You can have bad effects there. Okay, breakdown of, this probably becomes nonlinear. I don't know. So these are all pretty high, okay? These are pretty high. Celsius. Pardon me? Just curious. Yeah. Why, why is the soft one the highest temperature then? It, as you approach it, it starts to depolarize. Wouldn't you depolarize it? Okay, and this, this de the hard and soft refers to driving it. Right? Oh. Yeah. I and um, so I see, I think, what, oh yeah, I, uh, let's see. So yeah, the, the hard soft refers for the drive amplitude. So like the stresses that would depolarize it? Okay. Yeah, or the strains actually, probably, is, but it doesn't matter. And I wouldn't think too much about the difference in temperature here. I don't know what the connect, there might be a connection there. I don't know. So this, these tend to be used for hydrophones here, the soft ones. The softer ones tend to be more, not surprising, they tend to be more sensitive. So that's what you want to use as for a hydrophone. And you're not going to subject it typically to a lot of strain. But there's an exception to that. We'll talk about it. A blast wave, right? So when people want to deal, handle, measure blast waves, they go to something different. What do they do in Los Alamos? They used a loudspeaker instead of a standard kind of microphone, right? Uh, OK, so let me see what we got here. Uh, yeah, so the text will have all kinds, and we will, be de we will be substituting these constants in. We're going to be doing lining up a lot of numerical type examples. But we'll plug these things, um, you know, we'll get numbers out. We'll get sensitivities in actual, you know, millivolts or whatever, Pascal. Now, um, so even with this tightening of the standards here, there's still. Um, you know, you can get out of the linear, there's still problems here, you get out of the linear regime, temperature variations cause, can cause these, uh, the specifications to change, they're temperature dependent. This has all been quantified. You know, there's just somewhere, and, you know, I, 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 I guess it's online now, but I don't know, somewhere there's just huge amounts of data of what happens to these materials when you subject them to different temperatures, different pressures, and you go deeper in the ocean, driving electric fields, all that data has been quantified for all different kinds of material. Just huge amounts of data because this was such a big deal. 
We don't tend to think of it as much a big deal anymore, at least the public doesn't, but it's going to come up again, you know? It, it's going to happen. Um, so anyway, the rule here is that when you look at any value, for any, any, uh, any parameter, you know, like a, a, those matrix elements, right? You, you expect them to be accurate to only roughly 10%. That's what you, that's what, it's not a real precise game here, okay? But it's not such a big deal because you're gonna, you're never gonna trust a theoretical sensitivity. You're gonna measure the sensitivity, you know. The, the theoretical value just gets you in the ballpark, right? Because we make, a, I've told you that before, at least once. <laughs> so, but anyway, this is something to keep in mind, this 10% here. And, and I'm embarrassed to say, I don't know if this is, and Brian doesn't tell us, is this plus or minus 10% or is that the full range? What do you guys think? Plus or minus. Okay, good. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I, I always, when I write, you know, articles, so I always put, I'll put plus or minus or peak to, I'll say it's peak to peak. It's always a good idea because it's a factor of two can be a big thing in transduction and we'll see that actually um, eventually, maybe even today. So here's a great photograph of, I don't know what company did Brian, uh, oh, okay, the EDO, uh, I think, um, I think they're still in business. So here's different um, geometries, right? They come in all kinds of uh, shapes, uh, you know, plates, as you, and you saw some of these in the lab last week, plates, bars, rings, the rings can be radially polarized or longitudinally polarized, right? Uh, spherical shells. It looks like, that looks like a hemisphere right there, hemispherical shell. What's this, what's going on here? This is a big deal, right? And we'll, we'll talk a lot about this later on in the course. These are, so often called composite or segmented transducers. And you, we will specifically go through and actually do some calculations with this. Those, those uh, lighter colors there, are that's conducting material. It's either painted on or it's actually physically segmented. This piece is physically different than that and there's this metal plate in between that acts as an electrode. So you can see people have gone to a lot of trouble here and they didn't do it just because they were playing around, okay? There's reasons for all of this, immediate reasons at the time. <clears throat> so we'll discuss that, these um, segmented or composite drivers. <clears throat> um, here's another warning here. The properties can change just with time. You know what's going on in this? There's, there's electric field and stress built up in this material. So even if it just sits there, it's, it can change over time. Right? It's things you have to be aware of. And it's all been quantified. And uh, we'll see later some actual, I, th I don't know if Brian has any data, but it's, it's, this has all been quantified. Like I said, just reams of data out there somewhere. And I don't know if it's still classified or what. I have no idea. Anybody know? Anybody encountered that? Um, yeah, okay, we talked about, yeah, all right, we talked about that. Okay, so let's begin. Piezo ceramics are not the only kind of material. Depending upon your application, it may be better to use something else. So that's the, that's the, the, the message here, okay? So we're gonna go through, this is right from the book. And I've tried to sort of interpret things a little bit and select things, not put have it all in here. Let's go through these some different materials here. Uh, the first thing I need to point out to you is, and we'll see this in chapter eight, a figure of merit for hydrophones regarding their internal noise. So with a hydrophone signal, often you're concerned about signal to noise ratio, okay? If, you, if the signal's buried in the noise, you've got trouble, right? So you wanna get as big a signal to noise, you wanna reduce the noise relative to whatever the signal is as much as possible. And it turns out that a figure of merit there this is not obvious, is the product of D and G. We're well familiar with D now. It's how the material strains with electric field. G, I don't think we've discussed before, but to be, I think it's on the next quiz, okay? But it's not a big deal, don't, don't worry about it. All it is is, 
D is what pot, D is what we deal with when we have um, the electric field and the stress as independent variables. Okay, that's what we've been focused on now, just to try to make progress. Okay, but I remember I warned you there's three other independent variables you can choose. Um, and the G happens to correspond to when you have T, instead of E, you have D as the independent variable. And it will be convenient for us to switch to these, ultimately, switch independent variables. You, and you'll see, you'll see why. When you do that, <coughs> you get um, different coefficients in the transductions equations. They're all interrelated, but it's just convenient to call them something. So G happens to be how the strain changes with displacement field, rather than electric field. So it turns out what's important, it's not obvious, like I said, is the product of D and G. And because D is equal to epsilon E, just imagine replacing this with, think of this qualitatively here as epsilon E. If you want to maximize the product of D and G, you want to have the biggest D value you can, okay? And you also want to have the smallest permittivity, the smallest epsilon value to maximize that. So I'm, I'm mentioning this here because I think it'll, it'll come up, it comes up a little bit here. Okay, lithium sulfate. This is, um, this is naturally occurring and um, it has actually a long use in hydrophones. And the main advantage is that it has a large hydrostatic piezoelectric stress coefficient. So when subject to um, a, a long sound, a sound of long wavelengths, so that the the stress is all, all on all the surfaces, okay? We call that hydrostatic stress. It has a, um, that coefficient is large. Now it turns out that, and we'll see this, I don't think we've seen it yet, but we will. What's involved there is you have to sum over the, the piezoelectric strain values over all in, in three directions. It's, it's pretty obvious. We'll see this explicitly later. later. Um, so what's involved there? And the problem here is, when you're interested in this hydrostatic action here, is that some of these are, are negative. So you're, you're losing out. So you can try to shield one direction that gets kind of ugly, as you can imagine. But it turns out for lithium sulfate that one of these is just dominates by a lot, the other two. It's the D22. Um, it's roughly a factor of two. To an, between two and an order of magnitude greater than the other D constants. So you don't care that much about the fact that one of them can be negative. Uh, tourmaline is popular, and this is interesting here. It's very rugged, so it can handle, um, I, it's typically used in blast wave measurements. You're not going to damage it or overload it or, you know, or overload your electronics or whatever. It's very rugged for high pressure. Um, oh, and this happens to be the material that has, goes the other way for the Poisson's ratio type effect that we are just talking about. Yeah, tourmaline. <coughs> uh, Rochelle salt and ADP, there's some, there's some of the early trans, uh, sonar transducing materials. Um, they've been now replaced with other ones, but Rochelle salt is interesting, historically interesting, because it is, um, it's one of the most naturally occurring piezoelectric materials. And not long after World War II, um, synthetic Rochelle salt was manufactured. So presumably it was more, um, more crystalline or, you know, it had better properties, more regular, something like that, I don't know. But, and this was, um, I don't know for a fact, but this probably was the first example of a human-made material for sonar transduction. This is where it happened. And, then, you know, and after that, it's, it's very common now to use human-made materials, PZT. Um, it's, look at this, the Curie temperature is near room temperature. Well, that's not, <laughs> that's not good, right? So, um, it's going to have temperature sensitivity. The parameters will change with, with temperature when you get anywhere near the Curie temperature. And also moisture effects. You have to protect it from the environment if you have any humidity. So it's not great stuff, but it is, you know, there is this interesting history here. Here's a lead. 
Ni uh, metaniobate. I think I'm accenting. I think that's right. <laughs> Anybody know? Anybody heard of this before? Some material, lead metaniobate. Uh, it has a high Curie temperature, high, high hydrostatic piezoelectric strain constant. So you're getting a lot of transduction there when you subject it to hydro uh, hydrostatic, um, you know, pressure, equal pressure in all directions. And look at this, the GD product, which is what you need if you're trying to dig for a hydrophone, if you're digging a signal, you know, a weak signal out. Um, it's an order of magnitude greater than Navy Type 1. Uh, we'll stop here today and we'll pick this up on Monday, like I said. Uh, the final one here is antimony sulfur iodide. Uh, now, what's interesting about this is, what, what do you find interesting here? Look at this, this last paragraph here. And it's got this just 22 degree. So you want to stay out of the tropics, I, I would think, right? Um, what's interesting here is this. Modification of the compound has led to an increase, but they are still, what's Brian telling us here? They're investigating everything, okay? Because they know that even though something like this looks really bad, there's going to have some advantage somewhere, and it may be needed. So it was just, like I said, this was an intense, really intense. All this information was really a, a dramatic, I think, scientific and engineering-wise, you know? They just don't give up. You know, something that looks this bad, they're not going to give up. <laughs> they might find a use for it. That was the way things were. Um, okay, anybody have any questions? Uh, okay, so do we have a lab next week? Yes. Okay, so you, the, the second experiment is going to be due next for, uh, week from this Friday, right? Okay. So come by, make an arrangement to so come by and talk to me about the r reports.